My name is Chris Neal. I'm a neurosurgeon at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, professor of surgery at the Uniformed Services University. And today we're going to talk about skull fractures. Now, before we proceed, uh, I need to say I have no financial disclosures uh, related to this talk. And additionally, the views expressed in this presentation do not represent the official policy or opinion of the United States Navy, the Defense Health Agency, the Department of Defense, or the United States government. So what we're going to talk about is skull fractures and what you need to know about them from, a, from an overview standpoint. So by the end of this talk, you're going to be able to recognize different types of skull fractures, identify that potential for underlying intracranial injuries associated with each type of fracture, and start to think about potential treatments for these fractures. Now, with skull fractures, there are several ways that you can classify them, and one way is by fracture type. Is the fracture linear or non-displaced? Is it depressed? Or is it a diastatic fracture? And we'll go in through uh, each one of these more in detail. Now, we can also talk about their location. Is the fracture over the convexity? Is it in the skull base? It's the skull base. Is it the anterior, middle, or posterior? And what are the adjacent neurological or vascular structures associated with these fractures? And finally, we can talk about fracture orientation. This really plays a role uh, with the petrous temporal bone fractures, where we talk about transverse versus longitudinal fractures. Uh, but we'll get into the idea that maybe this, there's a better way or a newer way to talk about this, specifically uh, whether it involves the otic capsule or not. So let's first look at our linear or non-displaced fractures. So these are not uncommon uh, fractures that we will typically see um, after head trauma. The vast majority of these fractures do not need operative treatment, uh, but just a period of observation uh, to ensure that there is no uh, late developing or delayed developing underlying uh, intracranial injury. But a non-displaced convexity skull fracture typically does not require surgical intervention. Now, one thing to keep in mind, although it is uncommon, um, is a growing skull fracture you see in follow-up, which is the formation of a leptomeningeal cyst. Now, if this does occur, this would require operative uh, repair, but it is an uncommon complication secondary to a linear or non-displaced convexity skull fracture. Now, again, we see this convexity frontotemporal non-displaced fracture, but we always have to keep in mind what's underneath the fracture. What is the underlying brain parenchyma? What is the underlying nervous structures? What is the underlying vascular structures? We need to keep in mind. In this case, uh, we see the formation of an epidural hematoma uh, from this uh, classical appearance of a frontotemporal fracture likely involving the middle meningeal artery. This is a case where meeting certain size and clinical criteria uh, needs operative intervention. Again, we can also see this um, more into the posterior fossa where we see a linear non-displaced fracture. However, this fracture is located uh, adjacent to the transverse sinus and we see a large venous epidural hematoma formation. So again, when we see these non-displaced linear fractures, we don't want to be lulled into a sense of complacency that there's nothing there. Uh, there is a significant amount of force that is required to cause the skull to be fractured, and we have to respect that force and what it can do to the underlying brain. Now let's talk about depressed skull fracture. So now we're looking at even more force uh, being dissipated uh, through the skull. And as such, there is an increased risk of under, underlying parenchymal injury and also for seizures. Now, in general, if the depression of the fracture is greater than the thickness of the adjacent skull, that is an indication for surgical elevation. Now, if this is an open depressed skull fracture, that is an increased risk for infection and should undergo surgical debridement and elevation. 
The thing that we need to keep in mind with these types of fractures is, yes, there is the bony component, but also the underlying parenchymal injury. And as we see with this case, removing or elevating this um, bony fracture, we do see a significant amount of underlying parenchymal injury uh, with this hemorrhagic uh, contusion. Now in the same clinical example, we can also see a diastatic fracture, which is a fracture along the suture line or the previously fused suture line where the force of the fracture causes that suture line to become displaced. Again, more reflective of the amount of force uh, that was involved with the trauma. And in this particular case, with the diastatic fracture along the coronal suture, we need to keep in mind potentially underlying injuries to the superior sagittal sinus. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about skull-based fractures, and in particular an anterior skull-based fracture. And this is these are fractures that involve not only just the frontal bone, but can involve the sphenoids, ethmoid bones, in addition to the orbits and other facial bones. With these fractures, we have to keep in mind their associated complications. Now, CSF leaks are very common in anterior skull-based fractures, and oftentimes they will heal on their own. But specifically, when the fracture is adjacent to the ethmoids. The dura in this area is extraordinarily thin, and so there is a high risk of a spinal fluid leak. Now, the spinal fluid leak could also lead to meningitis if unrecognized. We also have to keep in account cranial nerve injuries, specifically cranial nerves 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, one may not be a nerve that we often test in the trauma bay, but it can have significant impact uh, to our patient's uh, quality of life, and so should be recognized uh, as early um, as possible and discussed. We can also see vascular injuries, and a more delayed uh, uh, injury that we can see is the formation of an encephalocele. So when we see these anterior skull-based fractures, they definitely require follow-up, even if they don't need immediate surgical treatment. When an anterior skull-based fracture does require surgical treatment, there's a lot of different approaches depending on the underlying injury, the structures involved. As we said, are we talking about the ethmoids, the sphenoids? sinus, uh, the orbits. Uh, is this something that can be repaired endoscopically? Or does this require an open repair? And with either approach, we need to think about the steps that will be involved, how we're going to identify if we're, if we're treating a spinal fluid leak or an encephalocele, or the materials that we will need to complete this repair uh, or repair the anterior skull base. And so when we do an open repair, uh, this typically involves a bifrontal craniotomy to access the anterior skull base. And we need to consider our dural repair techniques and preservation of the pericranium is a very common way to locally harvest a, a vascularized uh, graft. But there can be other considerations as well from a bony anterior floor repair, are we going to be able to plate? Is this going to need autologous bone uh, or mesh? So these are things that we need to consider before the surgery starts. Oftentimes, these anterior skull-based fractures are complex and involve a multidisciplinary team approach as there are typically facial features, orbital features, as well as frontal bone and intracranial injuries. Now, if we move more into the middle skull base, when we think about temporal bone fractures, 
a traditional way to think about these fractures have been whether the petrous portion involved has a longitudinal fracture or a transverse fracture. Classically, we would think longitudinal fractures are a more common fracture with a higher rate of conductive hearing loss from ossicle involvement. And with any temporal bone fracture, there is a risk of facial nerve injury. However, with a transverse fracture of the petrous portion, we usually see a higher rate of sensorineural hearing loss from otic capsule involvement, and there is a higher risk of facial nerve injury. Now here's an example uh, from a patient that unfortunately has evidence of both a transverse and longitudinal fracture uh, through the petrous bone. So while we typically have considered longitudinal and transverse a more a newer way of thinking about these fractures or whether they are otic capsule involving or otic capsule sparing. So as we work uh, within our skull-based teams, we will often um, hear our colleagues speak of temporal bone fractures as otic capsule sparing or involving. Now when we talk about posterior skull-based fractures, we start to get into the occipital condyles and whether we are dealing with uh, is this a stable or unstable fracture of the occipital uh, cervical junction, uh, which is a whole other talk uh, in and of itself. And finally, it's worth noting that if there is a bony fracture that involves the carotid canal, it warrants dedicated neurovascular imaging as there is a much higher risk of injury to the underlying vascular structure. So in summary, with skull fractures, there's a wide range in complexity. Uh, we can discuss about the type of fracture and the location of fracture. But in addition to thinking about the bony injury, we have to consider the underlying cranial nerves, brain parenchyma, the vascular structures, both arterial and venous, and the dural integrity as we do our initial and follow on assessments and as we determine a treatment strategy. Thank you.